All right, so we're ready to go. Good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. My name is Sid Javon. Um, I'm a senior at Tacoma Academy. Um, I'm also the president of our HOSA chapter, and I will be asking today's first question, which is directed to um, Dr. Noel Braithwaite, or Brathwaite. Uh, the question says, why was COVID so easily spread to cause a pandemic? Good evening. My name is Noel Brathwaite, and I'm the director of the Office of Minority Health for the Maryland Department of Health. And we are located in Baltimore. As a state office of minority health, we are charged with, and our mission is to ensure the safety and health of minorities within the state, and that would mean African Americans, we would mean those of African descent from the diaspora, we would also mean those of native indigenous groups, Hispanics, we also have Asian American Pacific Islanders. Close to 50% of the Marylanders are minority groups. And I take it a great pride to be able to interface with my partners in not only developing plans to improve and reduce the health threats, but also to a very great extent provide the venue for uh, not only the engagement of faith-based organizations, but also the engagement of community-based organizations. We do fund a number of partners. We call them Motor Minority of um, Minority Office of Technical Assistance. And we do fund them for two years. And we also have another agreement with a number of non-funded organizations. So that office is not only a productive office in my view, but also a critical office for advancing health and minority populations. It was founded around 2004 um, through the legislation of Nathan Shirley, Senator Nathan Shirley Pulliam. So that's about our office. And now to the, to the question, are you ready with the question? The question was about how does COVID spread to become a pandemic? And that's a, that's a good question. And this has to do with COVID, an infectious disease spreading from the country of origin to other parts of the world, from China to Europe, from Europe to the United States, from the United States to South America, also from the United States to the Caribbean, from Europe to Africa, from Europe to Australia. And so that's what we call a pandemic. An epidemic is when it is centered in a particular country. The pandemic is when it becomes global. It becomes international. And as you know, the spread of this disease has been through a number of routes. For example, as, as we know, we, we have an infectious disease which spreads by inhaling drops and exhaling drops. So individuals who are within close proximity could contract that um, infections through the, the droplets. And then they come in touch with their friends, their family. And so from one, it spreads to others through the inhaling and exhaling. The other thing is that one of the big problems at the very beginning was that they were not the protective public health measures in place then, as we have in place now. So it continued to spread. And right now, we do have the different kinds of pra um, practices in place. For example, we have mask wearing as one of the practices. We also have frequent hand washing, then social distancing. Those are some of the practices that have been adopted to curtail the spread of this infectious disease, which as I indicated earlier, started in China and then went worldwide. And we in the United States 
I've had a number of infections, we have had hospitalizations, and we have had deaths from this pandemic disease. Hi, my name is Blair Dyer. I'm in, I'm in 11th grade, I'm a junior, and I'm the secretary for HOPSA. Um, so my first question is directed to Dr. Warden Jarrett, and it is, does the mRNA vaccine get rid of COVID in someone if they have already, if they have the virus? Okay, thanks Blair for that wonderful question. Before we go into that, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Warden Jarrett. I'm a board certified family physician practicing right here in, in Maryland. I have an office, a group practice in Bowie, Maryland. Family physicians are unique, special people. We call ourselves womb to the tomb because we take care of all ages. I take care of little babies, all the way up to my oldest patient used to be 102, can you imagine? And so we take care of all aspects of chronic illnesses, acute illnesses, mental health, you name it, we're in the middle of it trying to enhance Marylanders' lives. In addition to that, I'm the Vice President for the Maryland Academy of Family Physicians. I'm a member of the Seabrook Seventh-day Adventist Church and one of our, I'm so proud of our youth and we have Naomi Jones here and I've watched her grow up. So it's just exciting to be here on this um, panel with you guys. So to answer your question, Blair, does RNA, um, messenger RNA vaccines actually alter uh, let's see, you said, does it alter the vaccine? Repeat it one more time for me. Um, I said, does the mRNA vaccine get rid of COVID in someone if they already have the virus? Okay. So in order to answer that question, people have to understand what's a messenger RNA vaccine, right? I mean, this is like new technology. And the best way I can think about it is if you have um, a secret service agent, and that secret service agent has to carry a secret message. So that secret message is in the messenger RNA. And so it gets injected in your deltoid, this muscle right here on your arms, and the body's immune system cells see this secret message and they're like, wait a minute, something has entered into our body. What is it? So it sends its little spies up to the deltoid and it's like, wait a minute, hold up, wait a minute. We've got we've got a, someone that doesn't belong. Who's that? Oh, it's messenger RNA. What's messenger RNA carrying? It's a secret protein. So the secret protein contains the sort of ingredients of how to make antibodies for COVID. And so the body sees this secret message, then sees the map and then goes and makes those proteins and then the messenger is destroyed. And as a result of that, you have antibodies. So if you were exposed to COVID-19, your body then has antibodies that can be prepared to fight it. So to address if people who've already had COVID, they would have had what we call natural immunity, whereas they had the actual COVID illness and their body built up antibodies with the hopes of if it ever came back, they could fight against it. What we don't know is how long that natural immunity lasts. We also don't know how long does the immunity last from someone who's vaccinated who never had the illness. So to answer your question specifically, Blair, no, getting, getting messenger RNA or getting the vaccine does not get rid of, it only augments your natural, your, your body's ability to make antibodies. Um, hi, I'm Kenna, and I'm a junior at TA, and I'm the treasurer of our chapter of HOSA. And my question is directed to Dr. Lydia Gilbert McLean. And the question is, what if you can just quickly explain what a peer review and scientific research is, and was the research on mRNA vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer peer reviewed by other scientists before it was released to the public? Hi, everybody. Good evening, and I'm happy to be here. I'm Lydia Gilbert McLean. I'm a board certified physician. My specialty is pulmonary diseases and critical care medicine. And just as a little bit of my background, I spent a couple of years at NIH working in the pulmonary division there. And then I spent several years working at the Food and Drug Administration. And I retired from the FDA as the former deputy division director in the pulmonary division a few years ago. And currently I work with pharmaceutical companies, helping them design trials, develop drugs for respiratory diseases. In fact, when COVID hit, 
as you can imagine, as a pulmonologist, I was quite busy with a lot of companies helping them as they try to develop therapeutics for this disease. I also do practice clinically in an ICU. I work with John Hopkins physicians and I work out at Suburban Hospital doing ICU care there. So that's a little bit about me. And most importantly, what I forgot to say, I am a proud Seventh-day Adventist. I belong to the Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church, but Seabrook is my second church home because that's where I got married. So <laughs> to your question, you ask about peer review. That's a very good question, especially in this day and age where everything has been so public. And most of the time when there was a research, even before it got to a peer review, journal you know you had a press release about you know about it and so forth but essentially what peer review means is that if you're talking about let's say a research article for instance that paper has been scientifically reviewed by a group of experts that are similar to you know whoever is writing you know that paper and it goes through that process of critique evaluation for ensuring there are no flaws that the, that the data the data presented what you know are not biased the data is true authentic before that paper can be published regarding moderna and pfizer's drug development per se whether that data itself has been peer reviewed in essence yes the data has been peer reviewed from two or three aspects. First of all, let me talk about the FDA review process. If you look at that in its totality, you can, you can view that as um, an example of peer review because when FDA reviews data before anything can be approved or deemed safe and effective, it's go it goes through this thorough review process where all the different experts involved in that application. So the immunologists, the CMC reviewers, those who look at the chemistry, the manufacturing, the statistics, review that data. And then specifically for the vaccines, each of them were presented to an advisory committee, which is comprised of another independent body of scientists and experts in that field. So that was the two two levels of peer review and then thirdly the actual studies themselves have been published in peer review journals so the actual publication of the studies sort of went along in parallel around the time when the advisory committee meetings were taking place so those two things more or less happened simultaneously but the data itself have been extensively reviewed before the agency made made a determination of safety and efficacy to allow the vaccines to be released for dissemination to the public. And if I can just add one thing, one point of clarification in terms of the vaccines that are currently on the market. So you would notice that, that I used the word I said released for dissemination you know, to the public. I did not say approved from a regulatory perspective. The, the FDA, there are two levels of um, allowing things to be disseminated for public use. So there's what you call an EUA, which is an emergency use authorization, which is the process that the agency used to allow these vaccines to be on the market. Does that mean they have a lower standard to what is a full approval or licensure? Not necessarily. Of the full approval and licensure that process it takes on other administrative elements in terms of manufacturing and in terms of providing additional long-term data which these drug companies moderna and pfizer are currently are, you know are, are currently doing but the complete set of data that they had to conduct to assure safety and efficacy was done before these two vaccines were allowed to be placed on the market. So I'll stop there. Who had the question for uh, uh, Ron Brathway, Dr. Ron Brathway? Um, I had the question for him. Um, so the question was, are the number of deaths and impact on the hospitals that we see on the news legitimate? Um, 
just a little, give you a little bit of background. I'm an internal medicine doctor, a hospitalist. I work at, in Los Angeles at Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital. Um, and it was not overblown. Um, the numbers were accurate. It may have been, been a little bit low, but the impact on the hospital, just to give you an example, we have about 120 bed hospital serving about a, a million people in South Los Angeles, mostly brown and black folks. Um, we had to double our capacity, almost double our capacity to 180 to 190 beds um, in order to deal with the surge of people who are coming through oh, January, February. And I was gotten a lot better, but the reports were accurate. I mean, we, our hospital unfortunately was, you know, um, LA Times, New York Times wrote about what we were dealing with, uh, but we were dealing with some of the hardest hit neighborhoods and areas in Los Angeles. And it was not overblown, it was, it was truth. Um, it, was, it was quite an amazing experience um, to go through. Who's the next? Um, I have the next. Um, my name is Naomi Jones. I am a junior. And this next question is for Dr. McLean. Uh, what company or person was the first to start testing or researching mRNA vaccines? Hi, Naomi. Nice to meet you. And thank you for your question. So you ask about company and person. So let me talk about the, well, let me talk about the person first, because if I don't talk about the person first, we wouldn't be here today talking about mRNA. Actually, the, the person who started this whole idea about the use of mRNA to solve, you know, diseases was a female Hungarian scientist in the early 1990s by the name of Kathleen Carrico. And her idea was on paper sounded, you know, plausible, but scientists and colleagues thought it was such an outlandish idea. They did not want to support her research at all. And it was only because she was persistent. She tried to get many grants and she tried over and over again, even eventually when she went to the University of Pennsylvania, after six years on, on the staff, they essentially demoted her because she wasn't getting any grants for her research, but she persevered and persevered. And because she knew that this idea, this technique, you know, eventually could be a breakthrough. And eventually she did team up with another collaborator at UPenn and did a lot of work on mRNA. They had to go back and, you know, tweak the science and appreciate that you couldn't just sequence an mRNA and put the entire thing in like that. You had to do some modification so that it would not be toxic. And they did all of that and they published their, their work, you know, in nature and think in, 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 in science. And it went unnoticed, but two scientists, one at in one in Boston and another scientist in Germany noticed the paper and thought this is something that you know could be worth you know, worth something, and they persevered. And out of that, Moderna was founded, and then a small biotech company in Germany was founded. So that was the person that really is responsible for persistence and perseverance for us being here today. And so, as far as the company is concerned, Moderna they is they actually started work on mRNA vaccine technology almost like 10 years ago. So when this pandemic hit, there was already a template. There was a lot of information. They had essentially, uh, you know, done the technology and understood how to create these. And so they were ready, you know, to move in to, you know, to what we had. They actually did some experimental vaccines with similar coronaviruses and the, the coronavirus that, that, that caused, that caused the, the MERS-CoV, the Mediterranean, um, Eastern Mediterranean um, respiratory um, distress syndrome, which is similar disease to what causes um, the SARS. They all in the same family of coronaviruses. So they had all that knowledge. By the time um, COVID hit, they were pretty much ready to go. Once they had the sequence for the coronavirus, they were able to rapidly um, sequence the mRNA, specifically the spike protein that would be used to make the vaccine. They were able to do that very quickly. So Moderna, 
is the name to remember as the first company. And then the person, Caitlin Kariko, who is now the vice president of BioNTech, which is the small German company. You don't hear much about them at all unless you are deep in the, in the science of this. But BioNTech, that German company, is a company that teamed up with Pfizer to create the Pfizer vaccine. So you would hear is the Pfizer vaccine. It is actually the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Very, very informative, huh? Who's next? Good evening, everyone. My name is Ayana McKinnis. I'm a junior and I also am the vice president of TA Toast chapter. And this next question is for Dr. Noel Brathwaite. And it is, how can we make sure that the less privileged have access to the vaccine? how can we make sure that they have less access have access to the vaccine a number of strategies are being used um, by the department of health and its partners and one of them is to go where the people are that means that in certain parts of Prince George's county certain parts of Montgomery county certain parts of the eastern shore certain parts of southern Maryland where they might have challenges with transportation, where that they might have challenges with getting um, an appointment online or where they might have challenges by having their phone not being the phone calls not being answered because of the long wait. Those challenges have been observed by us and um, there are a number of things that we are doing to ensure that the less fortunate, those who have certain barriers to access. It's not, it's not a matter now of um, what we call hesitancy. Hesitancy is not the primary barrier, but lack of access. And so to enable individuals, and, and here we get the term equity, to have equal access to the vaccines. The vaccines now are being taken to them. So we have churches in certain parts of Maryland are being used now as what we call pop-up centers for the people in the neighborhoods to come to those churches to get vaccinated. And then we, we have another mechanism which is to use mobile vans and those mobile vans go to areas where individuals might not be able to get to the vaccination center. There's also an interesting um, strategy that is being used and that is to help individuals get an appointment. It's not always easy for seniors um, to, to make appointments so they, they have advocates and um, individuals who are helping them. I, I hope that students from TA might be able to do that, help some seniors to um, get an, make an appointment and also um, Another thing that is being used in terms of public transportation, uh, even though this might be called a, a public, uh, a private company, is to, to offer them rides by Uber and, and by Lyft, but more so on Uber. So another, the, the guiding principle is to take the vaccination to the people instead of the people going to the vaccination sites. Um, one last thing is that we have a lot of a number of what we call mass vaccination sites. Um, there, some of them are in Prince George's County. And we have now about six that are going to be up and coming to provide individuals with access so that um, the low income individuals and those who have challenges with getting access through online and through telephone are now able to be vaccinated. And that's a big advantage uh, of where we are now from when we started the vaccination program. Thank you, Dr. Brathwaite. Uh, I'll keep that in mind. So I know some of our, I know the officers, you also be making note of that, how our students can become advocates to help seniors. That could be our own campaign. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can um, talk, you know, offline about that. Um, <clears throat> but thank you for that information. Who has and the... Go ahead. Here's another, here's another thing is that churches can also apply to be vaccination centers. I, I know, and this is not a secret, that um, Brinklow is being considered now um, 
and I think they're going to be visited on Friday so that Brinklow can become a vaccination site. Seabrook has a good parking lot, parking area. I don't know if the building, at one time they were renovating the building. I, I don't know if that building is finished or anything. Metropolitan has a very good parking lot and they're involved with the, the food distribution. So just a, a plug um, that there are some churches that can qualify if, if they apply. So give us a call and your church will be inspected to determine its suitability to be a vaccination site. All right, that's great. I was thinking more of Tacoma Academy's parking lot, but again, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Tacoma can also apply, um, yeah, because um, I, I think you have a great parking lot and the, the facility can be used. So it's just send us a, a note that you are interested. All right, thank you. Uh, who has the next question? Actually, I have two. The first one anybody can answer. It is a question that was given to us, which asks, does the temperature of the vaccine have an effect on how effective the vaccine is? So um, maybe the temperature that it's stored in, does that have an effect on if the vaccine is potent? Um, let me start. Let, let me start and then others can jump in. I just want to add one more thing since you asked about you know, the study, the time it took to develop the vaccine, just to add one more piece to that. So I talked about the technological aspect of things. They already had a template, they had prototypes and they were able to move along quickly. The other thing that came into play was the regulatory aspect of um, helping to speed things up. So typically, normally at the FDA, when you do a development program, whether it's a drug or a vaccine, you do phase one, you collect the data, you take it to the FDA, they review it and they said, okay, you can go on to phase two. Then you do phase two, which is dose ranging and et cetera. You go back, you review the data, and then you go on to phase three. Because I think sometimes when I've done some of these panels before and people have asked, well, did they skip any of the phases in the drug development? None of the phases was skipped. It's just that everything was done in a, in a way that it was progressive. So as soon as phase one data were finished, FDA was reviewing that data in real time. And already they were able to move into phase two and phase two and phase three was sort of a hybrid. So for example, for Pfizer and Moderna, they each of them enrolled over 30,000 patients altogether. But in that study, the way it was designed, the very first portion of that study, the first 300 patients were considered the phase two, where they looked at the multiple doses, they looked at the levels of immunogenicity, et cetera. They had an independent data safety monitoring board review those data, make determinations, and then from that data, then they went on to proceed to the quote unquote phase three portion of the study. So all of the phases were done, but they were done in a you know, in, 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 a, in a sequential pro progressive manner. So nothing was skipped. So that's the regulatory, the regulatory aspect of that that helped, that helped to speed things along. Now, in terms of the temperature for mRNA vaccines, because these are mRNA, mRNA is something that degrades very rapidly. In your body, natural mRNA that your body produces degrades in a matter of minutes. You know, once that mRNA, you know, leaves the nucleus and gets into the cytoplasm and gets into the ribosome and delivers its message, it's degraded by the enzymes within, within, the, within the cell. And so for the, these vaccines, they are modified in, in such a way that they were able, they're able to last a little longer. So I know for Moderna, it lasts about eight to 10 hours. And I imagine Pfizer is about the same. But in order for them to be effective, they have to be kept in super cold temperatures. So the range is anywhere between minus 60 to minus 80 degrees. And then once they thawed and then you know, diluted and reconstituted to produce the liquid that we inject into the patients, they have to be used within a certain period of time. I know for, for Moderna, it's within six hours. And I think Pfizer is about, you know, it's about the same thing too. So that's those. The other vaccines, like the Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca, they they are based on a different technology. It's called, you know, vector technology, which does which allows for them to be stored at, you know, 
at lower temperatures. They do not have to go through this, you know, super freezing that the mRNA vaccines have to go through. But it has to do with the fact that mRNA degrades rapidly. So if it's not kept stringently in that temperature, if it's thawed out, you know, it's it would not be effective. Great, thank you. Um, very good information. Uh, who's next with the question so we can keep on moving? Uh, I actually have one more question. Um, yeah, so the next question is for Dr. Noel Brathwaite. Um, a lot of people are skeptical about taking the vaccine. They're uh, hesitant. And uh, the question is, how can we encourage more people to get this vaccine? It's another good question. To encourage is one of the big principles in public health. So how can we encourage more people to get the vaccine? There are two or three things that we can do. One is to consider that we are what we call influencers in the community. I think that the, the teacher is, is looked at as, as a big influencer in the community. The, the pastor is looked at as a big influencer in the community, the doctor, the physician, those are great influencers of, of the, in the community. And so they, they can provide a, a public service announcement. They can testify that they have had the, the vaccine and it is good. And so <laughs> all hands on, uh, you have had it, I've had it. So I'm good to go. And so those, those influencers can talk about how they have had it and the benefit to them. Um, how the vaccine does not cause any side effect, or if it does cause any side effect, it's, it's sort of a mild, might have a, a twitch in the arm or a headache after the second dose. But um, th those are manageable. So the other thing is, if the hesitant person knows someone who has taken it, that is a good testimony because they can testify, hey, my friend took it, my mother took it, my Father took it, my some other relative took it, and so it's good for them. It's good for me. It takes away some of the negativity and the misconception that we have because we we have a personal um, influencer, we have a personal friend who, who does it, and, and and it is said that one of the biggest influencers of all the ones that I've mentioned is a private physician. If your physician recommends that you take it, you would more than likely. Um, Okay, so you who are physicians on this panel, I see three of you are, um, you, you can influence, influence individuals who want to wait and see, individuals who are very resistant, and that's the second category, and the third, those who are or hesitant. But I think if you don't, uh, if you aren't able to influence the very resistant, those say, hey, no matter what, and there are about 20% of those, uh, they're not going to take it, which would put the 80% in jeopardy in some instances. So those are some of the things that we can do to encourage those who um, are willing but not yet taking it, those who are saying, wait and see. Um, and you have a, a bigger challenge for those who are very, very um, resistant to it, uh, the anti-vaxxers group and so on. Uh, yeah, thank you for that response. Let's keep going, guys. Who's next? Um, the next question is, again, directed at Dr. Brathwaite. The question is, will there come a point in time where we can stop wearing masks, or does everyone have to be vaccinated for that to happen? And how long should we expect it to be before things get back to normal? Well, these questions are coming to me. Is it, uh, there's a reason for it, because I had an, another um, COVID-19 appointment at 630. Um, so I, I request that they uh, come sooner. Okay, so the, the, the question that you, you asked was, will there come a time when we can stop wearing masks or does everyone have to get vaccinated first? How should we expect it will be before things get back to normal? Okay, the, this brings us to the concept that is being heard today, it's called herd immunity. Um, the herd immunity is telling us that the more people who are vaccinated, the less need to be vaccinated. So in your classroom, 
if everybody has TB, then there's no need to protect the classroom from TB because everybody has, has it. everybody has an infectious disease in the classroom. There's no point of protecting anybody in the classroom because everybody has it. So there's no spreading of a disease when everybody has it or when a, a large enough percent of the population has it. So if 50% have and 50% don't, then you can spread it to the other 50%. So if 80 or 90% um, reach what we call herd immunity by vaccination, and then the, 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 the spread is not going to be significant at all. So the herd immunity would help us in terms of getting back to normal, in terms of personal lives, and it also help businesses to reopen. That is the, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we have to get um, the country moving from possibly a 25% total vaccine vaccinated to between 80 and 90% so that you can get protected. You can go back to some sense of normalcy. You could travel as you as you would like. Um, but at the same time, just like the influenza, uh, you might still have to take some precautionary measures once a year you get your, your influenza vaccine and I think Dr. Gilbert might be able to, to shed some more light on the, the question that's been raised is after you get vaccinated, how long does that vaccination give me some protection? Is it six months? Is it nine months? Um, what's the time? I, I, um, I will leave that question for her to answer. But my answer to the question is simply, uh, we have to reach a point where we have herd immunity, where the majority of the population is vaccinated, is protected, and the vac and the 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 um, the viruses have much of a wiggle room to infect other people because most people are protected. Okay, I think Dr. Dr. Brackett, um, you know, pick um, <laughs> pulled me in to make a few comments about um, durability of the in, of the immune response. So initially, we were not sure what we were going to be getting with these vaccines. Initially, people were saying, well, maybe with last three months, six months, they're not sure. Now, more and more, as Pfizer and Moderna continue to look at the data and uh, collecting more data, they're thinking actually that we can get immunity up to a couple of years with this, but we're going to at least need a booster. So at, at a minimum, we can expect that at least once a year, we're going to at least have a booster. The idea is that we probably won't need to get the two vaccines that we did initially, but just one. And they're actually conducting preliminary trials right now, looking at um, booster shots. So um, we don't know exactly how long the immunity lasts, but we do know that it is much longer than the few months that was initially tweeted around. We know it's much longer, but exactly how much longer is not entirely clear. But for now, we do know that we are at least going to have to be taking at least a booster shot once a year, and those trials have been started. Okay, guys, who's next? Uh, the next question is for Dr. McLean. Um, how were the vaccines tested? Like, were they tested on rats or other animals? Hi. Naomi again. Hi. Yes. So, yes, there were. You had the... So, just a little bit again, what's background, not to get into all the minutiae of the details, but as I mentioned earlier, there was already templates and platforms for how these mRNA vaccines were going to be were to be developed. A lot of preclinical work was done earlier with similar type vaccines, those same corona type vaccines, which this one that causes COVID-19 is a part of. They're called beta coronaviruses. When the actual vaccine for this specific coronavirus was being developed, there was initial testing in mice. And then later on, as the additional trials went on, there were there were trials in hamsters and trials in what we call non-primate humans, specifically, I think monkeys were done. So there were animal studies, preclinical studies that were done to support the fact that it causes immunogenicity, that the doses were not toxic and, and so forth. So yes, there were um, animal studies done with the vaccines. Was there anything else that you asked in that question or is that 
Big. No, that was that was it. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Let's move right along. Who's next? Um, this question is also directed for Dr. Lydia Gilbert McLean, and it's how long is the vaccine effective for, and how does this vaccine stack up against previous vaccines when it comes to stopping the spread of a disease? Okay, so I think we touched on that um, when um, um, a few minutes ago about how long. I think what you're asking is how long the immunity, um, how long the, Im the immunity lasts with a vaccine. We don't know exactly how long, and you wanted to know how it stacks up against, you know, other vaccines. Well, I sort of look at it this way. So there are like two spectrums. For example, the flu vaccine, the influenza, we take that every year because the immunity only lasts just you know for a season because the virus you know mutates and you always have to be tweaking that formula for the part you know for that particular season as opposed to um the vaccine that was that we used for measles it lasts a lifetime you know so there's two, those two extremes the coronavirus, the vaccine for the coronavirus is going to fall somewhere between the month to year or years range, where I think that based on how coronaviruses are, that we are going to have to be getting a vaccine, whether it's a booster or whether it's a full vaccination, you know, repeated, repetitively over a period of time. I don't think this is going to be a situation where, like measles, you get the vaccine and that's it. You would never get it again because eventually those antibodies are going to wax and wane and the effect is going to diminish. It's something that is called antibody decay. But so far in how they're looking at this, they think that it can last the immunity that is that is that is that, that results from being from being immunized with the, with these vaccines can last, they think, out to two to three years, but we're not entirely sure. Thank you so much. Next question, please. Okay, this question is for Dr. Brathwaite, and it is, what are the known side effects of the vaccine? Will it harm me if I take it? And have there been deaths attributed to receiving the mRNA vaccine? I had I had the Pfizer vaccine. The hospital gave it out in the very beginning, and um, the side effects were typically the first dose I had, you know, localized arm pain. The second dose, I felt some chills, uh, body aches for about twelve hours, but nothing more than that. And just talking to other people who, who got it up front, that's that's about all the side effects that they had. So it was mainly arm pain where the injection was, and then some body aches or chills with the second one. The second dose people tended to have a little bit of more reaction to. Uh, and that's pretty much the side effects. Now, um, the second question was, if you just repeat it for me. So you asked about side effects and then you asked about. Will the vaccine harm me if I take it? Just like if anyone takes it, will it harm them? You personally, as a young person? No, it's not, it won't, it won't harm you. The, the side effects that I felt would probably be the same side effects that you feel. So. Um, for example, uh, when the vaccine becomes available for uh, persons that are younger, if Carrie wanted to take the vaccine, I would definitely let her take the vaccine. Um, so that, won't, that, that I would not be concerned about side effects for the vaccine in, in a young, healthy person like yourself. And for the most part, people feel muscle aches and body aches. That's about it. And then there was a third part of your question. As far as the mRNA vaccines, I had the Pfizer vaccine and people, you know, the Pfizer versus Moderna, I, I haven't heard much of a difference. As far as deaths, I I personally, and just reading the literature, have not seen any deaths that were directly attributed to the vaccine. Now people can die for other causes around the time that they get a vaccine. And so that can make people very nervous. But you know, I've been optimistic and very, um, um, encouraged that the vaccine has rolled out and there's been a, a, it's been very little side effects for most people. And my mom got it, my dad got it, um, and they they just carried on. So I'm I'm personal personal uh, observation and just reading the literature. This vaccine is being tolerated very well. So uh, who has the next question? Um, this question is directed towards Dr. Warren Jarrett. And speaking of side effects, like from the previous question, 
Are there people who have had COVID and survived? Are those people suffering from any long-term side effects? Oh, that's a great, great question. So before I dive into that, I want to, are all of you guys, or are many of you pre-med aspiring physicians? I want to open up an opportunity for you to come shadow me in my office. I can give um, your professor, um, Sean Robinson here, my contact information, but it's a good thing when you guys can come and we can have a longitudinal program. You can come out in the summer, your spring breaks, or I'm right in buoy. So I think it's a good thing for you guys to be able to come out and see what a doctor does, get your hands wet. Well, you have you buy a little white coat. We'll make this thing official, okay? So um, I teach medical students, and so I have a passion for teaching. I'm affiliated with the University of Maryland on that front. Um, the answer to your question, I have lots of patients who had COVID a year ago, and sadly, some of them are dealing with some issues today, like a lot of long-term effects. However, that's not to say I have a lot more that had COVID and are just fine. So it kind of depends on what their underlying medical issues and medical problems are. Um, how was their health before they had COVID? What's kind of like what's running, you know, so those are a lot of factors that that play into it. I'll tell you some of my asthmatics or some of my people who smoke or people who've had like underlying lung problems. Some of them have had a difficult time um, bouncing, bouncing back. But I had a I had a 96 year old patient who had COVID and she's doing great. Had a 30 something year old patient who also had Lyme disease like last year. She's not having such a good time. And she's been struggling to breathe and get back to her baseline. So kind of right now, they're still collecting that data. Um, it's important for people to see their primary care physician so that these data banks of side effects and long-term effects after COVID can be documented. And it's good to have forums like this where we can share information and share the stories because this is how we collect information. Um, so yeah, there are people who do have some long-term effects, but it's not everyone. I'd say it's a, a minority who already had issues. Now, I'll jump on on that as far as the patients who are hospitalized that we discharge from the hospital. Unfortunately, those tend to be the sicker patients and those patients are having a lot of lung issues. The COVID attacks the lung tissue and causes it to scar. And so we do have a fair amount of patients who are being discharged with oxygen and have been, and we've been telling them that they should expect uh, some long-term use of oxygen and some long-term effects from COVID, especially when it comes to respiratory and energy and ability to walk without getting short of breath. So um, the patients who come into the hospital, I think the biggest long-term effect of COVID is gonna be lung issues and ability to breathe without the use of uh, supplemental oxygen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Ron, wouldn't you agree that, that those are seen up in the older population as well? So the, the patients who end up in the hospital with COVID tend to have obesity, uh, diabetes, mm -hmm. some chronic medical illness, and uh, older, um, but definitely obesity and diabetes are two things that um, are very bad indicators when it comes to COVID and long-term effects. So, yeah. uh, I wanted to jump in on that. I think um, <clears throat> one of the questions of the spinoff of this is, are there any, are you guys seeing any um, long-term effects of the vaccine? on people, you know, those those mild side effects that you talked about, but are you seeing anything long-term um, occurring in people who act, have actually received the vaccine? So I can answer that since we, um, in primary care setting, we're, we're big on that. And in fact, Maryland has 40 offices, primary care offices that are, have been chosen to be a pilot to give the vaccine of which my office is one. So as of next week, we'll be also administering um, the COVID vaccine. We're not sure if we're going to have Moderna or Johnson & Johnson. But that being said, um, I would say the vast, if you remember the bell curve, I would say everyone who falls under the, most people are falling under the bell curve. They're taking the vaccine, doing great, doing great. You have some outliers that may have had some underlying issues. There may have been some coincidences. I can think of one person that, you know, just developed terrible diarrhea, but that's a known side effect that's not as common, but it can happen and lost some fluids, things like that. So I'd say most people are doing very well. I, I have not heard of someone who's having, they had the vaccine and just went downhill after that. None of my patients. All right. More questions, we ready? Go ahead, Skip. Okay, um, I have the next question and it is for Dr. Warden Jarrett. 
And the question is, um, will there be a vaccine made for children? And if so, how is that different? Excellent question, Sid. So they're having clinical trials going on right now for our children um, because, you know, I think it's Pfizer, one of them is 16 and one is 18. So everyone under 16 is kind of vulnerable right now. And I'm trying, I have kids and I'm so proud of you guys because just looking at you and how mature you are makes me say, you know, I could send my kids to TA. I have a 12 year old and a 10 year old. I'm so proud of you right now. So I was thinking about enrolling my kids in a clinical trial. They have one going on in Frederick, one University of Maryland. My son overheard and he's like, I don't want to be part of a clinical trial. So, you know, when you guys are like in middle school, you have like, you know, you have like thoughts and concerns. So I'm going to listen to them, but they want to get the vaccine. They just don't want to be a part of the trial. So it, it's going to be the same, the Moderna and the Pfizer. What they're trying to do right now is figure out the exact dose. Would it be half? Because kids are not just little adults or little people. Kids got their own thing going on, their own dynamic. You know, they're going to do it based on the weight of the child, the age of the child, probably more weight based. So, yeah, it's coming down the pipeline. Um, I think Dr. Fauci and some others have estimated. I don't really want to put a number out in space, but it's going to be a while before the kids come simply because once again, you need parents who are willing to put their kids in clinical trials. <laughs> and so, um, but the data there, there'll be people. And so the vaccine should be available. I'm, that's on the Operation Warp Speed too. And the same for pregnant women. Um, you know, some people ask sometimes like, well, if I'm pregnant, should I take this vaccine? Um, I, yeah. I mean, granted, what pregnant woman do you know is gonna say, put me in the trial, put me in the trial. It's hard to find, but even as we speak now, there are pregnancy, uh, there are pregnancy trials going on right now. And so what we do know is that you have this unknown virus that's taking out millions of people worldwide versus a vaccine that's designed to save lives, help us, most importantly, prevent death, ICU and intubations and all of that. So we're sharing with our pregnant women, you know, yeah, get the vaccine, like do it. Um, but the some who might be reserved or, un, you know, just uncertain about it, we, uh, my goal is to give people education so that they can make informed decisions. Do you guys remember back in the day in Crater Roll used to sing, the wise man built his house upon the rock, foolish man built his house on the what? the sand, and then when the rains came, it washed, okay. So it's the same thing in healthcare. You want people to make, you want your patients to make decisions that are well-informed based on a platform of solid scientific evidence. And it's your job, my job as ambassadors of science to, to use your platform, to use your voice, to give people information that they can trust. So even as high school students, you guys have a voice. You can influence your parents, your influencers. You know, you can use your social media platforms. You can talk about the work you're doing with HOSA. You're influencer. So that's how people can get and you lead people to information they can trust. So we want to encourage people to build on the rock so they can make well-informed decisions. Okay. Um, I did have I did have a question here. Um, one of one of the adults asked this one. Uh, this didn't come from the kids. So um, they wanted to know what would you say, what do you uh, as healthcare professionals and just family members or friends, what do you say to people who are just scared to take the vaccine for whatever reason? Uh, you know, they cite things like Tuskegee or, or, or just um, it was too fast or, you know, um, what, what do you say to people to try to encourage them? So I, as you can imagine, the primary care provider who touches probably 80 plus people a week, I've heard quite a few conspiracy theories and quite a few fears over the last several months about the vaccine. Tuskegee being a huge one. People thought tracers were going to be in it. People didn't trust the president, former president number 45. And they said anything coming out of his administration. These are root. These were myths. I actually did a podcast or not a podcast. I did a YouTube thing called Urban Myths and Country Tales of the COVID-19 vaccine, where we touched on some of these issues. The first thing you have to do when you're encouraging people to build their information information on the solid rock platform is find out what their concerns are directly and then you hit them head on. So the, for the person who has concerns over how this country has mistreated people for disparities in healthcare, especially in, in uh, communities of color, you would address that and how I've done it and this is we're just getting real. I've told my African-American patients who were concerned about it, I'm like, look, 
I understand the country has stains. I get the Tuskegee, but what country do you know where they would actually ex put the healthcare workforce at the front line of getting the vaccine first if it was supposed to do harm? And when I throw it back at them like that, I usually get people like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. I said, if this if this vaccine was meant to experiment and take out black people, they would be giving it to homeless black people, you know, free. And it would have been all the blacks first, you know, and when people start thinking about that, they're like, oh, Dr. Jared, I kind of see what you're saying. So you want to get people's kind of understanding of why they're afraid about it. You have to zone in on that. And then you can gingerly approach them and lead them to sources where they can build a platform. We can't force people. You know, there's an expression that you can lead the, wa the horse to the water, but you can't force the um, horse to drink the water. And so it's the same thing here. Our job as healthcare professionals is to help people gain access to trusted information, and bring them into the light and keep nudging them along, encouraging and educating them using our voice and um, going in that direction. Yeah, I have I have cousins and family get together that, that Oh man, everything from being monitored to, uh, like she was saying, experimented on. And you know, my initial my initial impression or what I want to do is just you know like okay, what well, just kind of toss it off. But you have to listen to people. You have to listen to people because in the context of a lot of things in this country, in the context of our previous administration and the presidency, in the context of just being lived in a in in a you know, as an African American male in this country, you see things from a different perspective. And it's the narrative that oftentimes is being sold. You understand that there is something oftentimes that underneath it that's not necessarily true. So that the, the the skepticism doesn't come out of the out of thin air, you know. And so it, it as a as a healthcare professional in a family of I have a very diverse family and everybody from doctors to um you know, just regular common foe. And then, and I heard, I heard everything at family get togethers. And sometimes I could address it. Sometimes I just had to leave it alone. And so sometimes I just focus on the elderly folk in my family because the stakes are higher for them. You know, but as far as my, you know, cousins, my own age, if you don't want to get it, then at the end of the day, that's on you. But mom, you need to get the vaccine because if you get it, it's going to be different than, you know, if somebody else gets it. So it, it's it's very interesting to be a healthcare professional during this time because you get tossed a lot of questions, but the the skepticism doesn't come out of thin air. It, it there's a context for it, and people do not like to be made fun of. They want to be heard, and even though they sound you know some of the ideas I heard sounded crazy, you have to listen. You just I just have to take a deep breath and just listen. Okay, well this is what you're concerned. Let me let me listen to you. So all right, well. Um, do you any any of the students? Do you have any other questions? I'm try to wrap it up. All the questions. Um, there is one last one, but I know that both of you had said that you had previously gotten vaccinated, which is great. That's super exciting. Would you mind telling when you got vaccinated and which vaccine you took? All right, I was vaccinated in January with Pfizer. My husband had Moderna, and we're both doing well. Yeah, I got vaccinated in January, and like uh, she was saying, it's a two-dose vaccine. So uh, I think my vaccine doses were about 20 days apart, um, and so it was January that I got vaccinated and um, with the Pfizer vaccine. Okay, that's great. I would really appreciate your time, um, and, I, and I'm holding up these students. I know they want to get out of out of this TA thing. It'll be early morning. We'll be back in school tomorrow, so. Really, really do appreciate your time. And um, hopefully we can call on you again. Don't forget TA, we're here. And you know we, we have some very, very bright students. As you can see, um, thank you all. Thank Naomi and Blair and Kenna and Sid and Nayana, um, Dr. Brathway, Dr. Jared. Thank you guys. Can I say something real quick? Oh, sure. Yeah, I just, you know, again, that's a 1993. I just wanted to tell y'all I was, you know, I was where you were um, in friendships. You know, I know I've known Janine for a long, long time. Um, and so friendships matter. So if you can, like you all are doing now, get that whole group of people like-minded, studying, pushing each other, getting together, it's gonna make a big difference. Um, and you're gonna run across each other in college and in medical school and, you know, all types of things. And so, um, you know, I was, again, I graduated from TA and went on to the University of Maryland and went on to, uh, to Loma Linda for residency and these friendships that you're forming now 
you'll be surprised. Uh, we had multiple people in my class become physicians um, and it's just been a, a beautiful thing to see. So whatever you all can want to accomplish, you can, but you're gonna need friends along the way and your group of friends are gonna be important. So just wanna encourage you all. And, and we're here as advisors, so I would love to have all of you come shadow and, and rotate in my office because a foundation for any, any specialty in medicine, you have to kind of come through, pay your primary care dues. So it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do and I'm, I'm here for you guys.